Hi, my name's Stian Westlake, and I'd like to talk today about the idea of a data moonshot for better and more prolific data collaboration. Um, I've got three particular interests in this. Um, not long ago, I co-wrote a book about the intangible economy and what needs to make it work. Um, I recently worked as a government advisor on science and innovation policy, um, but most importantly, I recently joined the Royal Statistical Society as their chief executive. Um, I'm going to first of all kick off by talking a little bit about the economics of data and how that affects what we might do. Um, if you really don't like economics, this is a great time, this being a video conference, to pop out and make yourself a cup of tea. I will probably only take about two minutes, so it will probably be a weak cup of tea, but you're forewarned. Um, the story that um, I tell in Capitalism About Capital is a story of how the world economy, once upon a time, the, the capital in that economy, the things we used to invest in, used to be physical things, things you could see and touch, like machines or buildings or plants. Um, that used to represent about 15% of world GDP per year. Um, it was what it was the sinews of the economy 40 years ago. Over the last 40 years, that's changed. And what now makes the world economy work is intangible assets, things you can't see or touch, like R&D, software, brands, supply chains, and of course, data. Um, Data and other intangible assets are kind of funky from an economic point of view. They behave differently from, from, from other types of investments for two reasons that are going to be important to us. One is that they have spillovers. So if you're a business and you invest in some data and that data is widely published, other people may benefit from it as well as you. You can't be your competitors may benefit from it. There is a kind of challenge there if you're relying on self-interested businesses to do your investment, that won't get you all that way. Um, the other thing about intangible assets generally and data in particular is they have what economists like to call synergies. They're really good when you combine them together, which is exactly why data collaboration is so important. If you have a little bit of information, um, an information about a small number of customers or an a small amount of epidemiological information, it's not hugely useful. If you can combine that, with lots of similar data or lots of different data, suddenly those things can become much more valuable. And that's a general property of these intangible assets. So we're moving from an economy where you could just build your factory and get on with things to an economy where the capital that we all depend on has these characteristics that it will be underproduced if you just rely on businesses to do their thing. And it really matters how you combine it, those synergies. Um, into this kind of problem typically steps government and in when it when there are investments that have a lot of these so-called uh, so-called spillovers um, you typically expect government to step up to the plate and invest in some of them and that's what's traditionally happened with for example r d the british government funds about 10 billion pounds worth of r d a year business backs 20 billion um, if government didn't do that funding the UK's economy would be doing even less well than it currently is. Um, if we think about something like education and training, another really important intangible, um, in Britain the government spends £90 billion a year on that. So in some areas our politicians, our political culture have got the idea that investing in these intangibles is something really important to do, something that is worth spending taxpayers money on if we want a thriving economy and society. Um, but that kind of message hasn't quite got through that much on data. Now, obviously, there is a tradition of governments publishing and providing data. Things like the Ordnance Survey and the tradition of national statistics are really old, in some cases centuries old. But the scale at which that goes on, the scale at which government sees it being worth publishing data, is still pretty small compared to the funding of general research or let alone funding education. And it's something that isn't quite in the mindset of how we talk about politics. So when people talk, when we talk, we talk about the, the, the purpose of the money that we spend on, say, the Office of National Statistics or providing health data, we see it from a functional point of view. But often we lack the bigger picture about how real investment in data and really making that data sing can have a transformative effect on, on, on society. So I guess 
my 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 pitch when I talk to people in politics or to anyone who's a citizen and who cares about these things is to say that if you kind of want to follow the current UK's government advice that we need to build, 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 um, then data is a really important place to start. And if we're thinking of moonshots, if we're thinking of big, ambitious technical projects that can improve the world, data is a neglected area, but it's an area that deserves a lot more love and a lot more credit and probably a lot more public funding and government attention. Um, one of the places where the RSS has been vocal about this before is through our data manifesto, um, our kind of manifesto for what should happen in the data world. Uh, we published the most recent version last year, um, and this was kind of a product of the input of our many members who are statisticians and who work with data. Um, and it made, in my opinion, some really important uh, Kate arguments that I think should form part of what you might call a, um, a, a data moonshot. The first and kind of most obvious thing is this idea that we should be investing much more in our data infrastructure as, as a country. In the same, we're very happy at the moment, or governments are very happy to spend billions of pounds producing academic research papers, some of which are really important, some of which perhaps maybe only get read a few dozen times and are sealed away in a, a, an academic journal somewhere. Um, we should be thinking much more about how we invest in data in the same way. Um, and there's a really political message here. I think if you look at something like Anna Powell Smith's Missing Numbers Project or her thoughts about the government data graveyard, um, there are loads of things that governments, the UK government, should be informing citizens about, should be holding itself to, accountable, to account for, which simply aren't published. So I think the, the, first, the first thing we would call for is whenever government does something, whenever the law is changed, whenever something important is going on, um, that we should be pushing for data to be made available, data to be made open about that. Um, but I think it's not just, this is not just a kind of government property and government accountability uh, issue. This is also about producing bigger data sets that other people can use and, and make valuable research contributions to. Um, if I think about things which, you know, I would call moonshots in a sense, really important infrastructural data projects that create lots of new opportunities. I think of something like, if I were in Leeds for this event today, down the road in Bradford, the ACT Early North project, which brings together an absolutely unique set of data on early years performance in Bradford, the youngest city in the UK, um, which is going to be an absolute treasure trove for public health researchers, for anyone who cares about tackling deprivation and child poverty, um, and more generally about improving the world. That was, I'm told by the people who run it, incredibly hard to get funding for because it didn't look like a real academic project, but it wasn't a public health project. Um, thanks to some far-sighted work by the council and the local NHS, it did get funding, it cobbled it together and it created something really impressive. Um, but we have a kind of system where funding academic papers as Ben Goldacre, one of the earlier speakers today, said funding academic papers is easier, funding data tools is harder. So I think pushing on those kind of big projects is really important. Another example from my time in government, um, I was involved in the design of uh, an R&D project called the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. And the idea of that was to put together pretty big collaborations between business and researchers. These were typically in the kind of hundreds of millions of pounds range. Um, and the idea was they would improve society, they would generate economic growth and, you know, would be a, a, a good thing for the government to do. Um, lots of the bids for those projects were from kind of industrial companies, people who manufacture things, um, which are all really valuable. There were few to none that were about building really valuable data resources, whether that's digital twins, public health data sets. Um, and... I think this is an area where we really want to see governments using more, using, uh, being more inspired and thinking about how they can invest and work with businesses, local government to generate really valuable 
data, data resources, and to be more ambitious. Um, those points all kind of come back to this economic idea of spillovers. The reason why we want government spending money on this is because the private sector will invest to a certain extent, but there are public benefits. These, 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 these data assets are public goods. Um, but I also mentioned that intangibles and data specifically has this kind of idea of synergies, that they're especially valuable when you combine it. And I guess they're the call to action for, for governments is to say, well, how do we make those, those, those ideal combinations happen? How do we create a world where collaboration works well, happens a lot, and is, is, is positive? Um, and I guess there's kind of a few really interesting things that, 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 that I look at that I think we ought to be doing more of. Um, one is the effective and privacy respectful merging of data sets. So um, the work that the Oxford Evidence-Based Medicine Data Lab have been doing on the Open Safely platform, which has seems to be providing some really valuable insights into the progress of the COVID epidemic, would be one example of that. Um, how do you bring together extremely confidential medical information about people um, in a way that you can analyse it with respect for confidentiality? Um, the idea that this is a really valuable investment that our research funders, that our government should be backing, seems really important. And if we want to make those synergies work, that's absolutely that's absolutely essential. I guess the second thing, and you know, ODI Leads is a great place to be saying this, is more hubs and programs for building networks to share data. Um, I am a long-standing fan of the work that ODI Leads has 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 been pioneering in this area. And um, I was thrilled that uh, they did some work with me when I was in government. Um, I think ODI Leads have, have really blazed a trail here. I think other projects like Datakind UK that brings together data scientists and charities who often have underutilised data sources or don't know how to collect the right data is another great example. Um, so the idea of, it, of, of, of backing hubs, of creating more of them, seems like something that it, maybe it looks very touchy-feely, but it's hugely important if we want more collaboration in this area. Um, and then I guess the issue, which, which we've, we've heard a bit about already today, is how data ethics and standards um, interact with, with, with all of this. And I think if I'm pitching this message at government, um, the most valuable thing that they should be looking at is how do we create and further and codify the results of a national conversation on data ethics? Um, and thinking with my kind of general science policy hat on, this is something that there are success stories in the past in other fields. So if we think about um, embryology, for example, which you know has been and in many places of the world still is an incredibly controversial field, I think the UK government in the 1990s was actually pretty forward thinking there and really fostered a national conversation, got ethicists involved, in some cases funded research, but also brought together discussions with the result that it created a relatively stable, consensual, ethical framework for, 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 how, that ran, for how that ran, which was kind of to the advantage of the UK, not just in preventing bad things, but actually in giving stability so that good things could, could be done. Um, clearly, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of investment in um, organisations that, 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 that look at data ethics. Um, but this is, I think, something that we just need to keep on pushing on and keep on supporting. Um, the other side of this is uh, perhaps the international side. And, um, you know, this conference, the, the collaboration between the Netherlands and the UK is a really great example. Um, it's great to see the Netherlands reaching out to us in this way, I would hope that the UK government could start reaching out as well and playing a more active role in international efforts to set to set standards. I think as a as a as a British person, that's something where a relatively small investment could yield big benefits, both for the world as a whole and for Britain specifically. Um, and then I guess a further dimension to this, um, I was in the briefing for this session, I was asked how we could make data work for the many, not for the few. Um, but when I think of that, I think perhaps we should turn that on its head and say, how can we make data work for 
minorities, wherever they may be in society, rather than just data that serves the interest of the majority. And particularly at a time when the Black Lives Matter protests have made systematic discrimination so salient um, in society, the need for granular, specific data um, that casts light on discrimination and highlights injustices seems more urgent than ever. Um, I think this is an area where there have been historical huge oversights in the part of public data that we've been collecting and obviously there is a separate issue about the potential for discrimination by algorithms that we use. This strikes me as a huge opportunity where, where the right kind of intervention could make a huge difference. Um, so I guess where I would it seems to me really clear that there is a moonshot opportunity on data, an opportunity for us as a society to invest more, to build more of a, um, a, 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 a collaborative, um, a, a collaborative around this, and to build norms where we use data well and come together effectively around it. Um, I've talked about this to some extent from a public policy point of view. But the public policy is not going to write itself. The politicians are not going to do this themselves for all the fine words that occasionally we hear about how they really like Bayesian statistics and Monte Carlo simulations, to, 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 to quote one minister from last weekend. Um, this needs a movement, and it will essentially have to be a movement comprised of people like you who work with data, who know data, and who know the contribution that it can make to a good society. From that point of view, it is really fortunate that data analysis and data analysts are cool at the moment, are in demand, whether that's in business or in government or in wider society, because it gives you and gives us a platform to, to make those demands, to point out how investment is really important, how this needs to be done in the right collaborative and the right ethical framework. And the, 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 the time to do this is, is, is very much now. Um, so this is a chance to, to make your voices heard, um, to really drive these moonshot projects that can change the world and to push for better understanding and more collaboration. Um, so I think this is exciting to be here and um, I look forward to seeing what we can do next.